my character or my vocab right now? It can be vocab. That's fine. Okay. What's up? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our debate. The topic today is Jesus, God. Our two debaters are apologist Anthony Rogers. He'll be answering in the affirmative from the Christian perspective. I encourage you to check out his other debates on YouTube. And answering in the negative will be our Islamic apologist Jamar Sadat, who will be taking his seat as soon as he is in character. Uh, that's myself, vocab. And he will be answering, no, Jesus is not God. And I encourage you to check out his website, 101 Reasons Why Christianity is False.net. Uh, I want to thank uh, the Center for Religious Debate, George Saig, and the team for putting this on. We will have two 20-minute opening statements, followed by two 10-minute rebuttals, followed by two 5-minute conclusions, and uh, then the Jamar Sadat character will give a alternative conclusion. With that, ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together, please, for apologist Mr. Anthony Rogers. Good afternoon. My name is Anthony Rogers. I'd like to thank the Center for Religious Debate for the opportunity to defend the deity of Christ today. Uh, I write for AnsweringIslam.org and AnsweringMuslims.com, among other things, and I look forward to engaging my opponent in this debate. Salam, my name is Jamar Sadat. I will be representing the Islamic side, and I want to faithfully invite all Christians to the straight path of Islam today. Thank you. First, I'd like to begin by giving all praise and thanks to the only true triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I'd also like to thank uh, George Saik and Ministry to Muslims and the Center for Religious Debate for this opportunity. Uh, and I'd like to thank my debate opponent and welcome all the Muslims uh, who might be in attendance or who might be watching by way of video. Um, with that said, I'd like to get right into this. Uh, since many of the Muslims that I interact with uh, so often uncritically follow liberal scholars and thus tend to view uh, the New Testament in a negative light or in a light that is not uh, shared by Christians, I, I want to... Uh, take an approach in this debate that I think will be relevant to at least what is true of current Islamic apologetic uh, approaches, what, what's true to their uh, manner of engagement, at least in the late or in the early 21st century. Uh, the approach that I'm going to take is going to focus mostly on the Gospel of Mark. It's often argued that Mark, being the earliest gospel, re represents a more primitive, more reliable view of Jesus than the later gospels. Uh, Matthew and Luke are held to be somewhat more reliable than John, but less reliable than Mark, and John then being the least reliable of all. In other words, in the history of the composition of the New Testament, and it's uh, being included in the canon, it's often thought that you have something of an evolution going on, where Jesus is being upgraded from one gospel to the other. He's being supersized, if you will. In Mark's gospel, he's presented as a simple messenger and prophet, uh, which is supposed to be the position of Islam. And in Matthew and Luke, he's somewhat uh, you know, elevated and given a more lofty status, a more uh, exalted role. And then finally in John, he's made out to be a full-blown god uh, or man-god. Uh, that's the, the caricature of Muslims. I guess my opening statement's not uh, relevant to my opponent. He just... <laughs> Anyways. Uh, now, what I'm going to do then in this debate is offer something of an a fortiori argument for the deity of Christ. I'm going to focus on the Gospel of Mark, demonstrating Christ's deity from it. And what that means is, since scholarship grants that a higher view of Jesus is found in the later writings of the, the New Testament, uh, not just the Gospels, but say the writing of the book of Hebrews, uh, or something of that nature, since that's already granted, proving that it's found in the earlier gospel of Mark, the earliest gospel in fact, will already tell us then what kind of uh, teaching about Jesus can be expected to be found in the rest of the New Testament, and it will also uh, undermine the Islamic argument based on liberal scholarship that the position of the New Testament is an evolving Christology rather than a uh, uniform uh, position on Jesus from the get-go. Now, I believe that uh, I accept the traditional view that the author of this gospel is John Mark, uh, the cousin of Barnabas, the companion of Paul, the companion of Peter. Uh, in fact, Peter mentions him and calls him his son in the faith in 1 Peter uh, 5.13. Uh, 
Uh, so I accept that traditional description of authorship. All of the uh, manuscripts ascribing authorship to uh, this gospel ascribe it to Mark. There's not a single exception, as we would expect if there was never uh, any name officially attached to this. And if it was pseudonymous, you'd expect there to be many opinions on that. Uh, and I accept the traditional view that Peter stands behind this gospel, that Peter, in fact, is the one uh, on whose uh, uh, authority, Mark is writing this. We're told in all of the early sources, without any exception, uh, that this is based on the memoirs and preaching of Peter. And so, with that said, I'd like to get right into it. If my opponent has any objections to that, I'd be happy to hear them and respond to them. Uh, now, I want to make it clear, before giving all the evidence from Mark, that, uh, or at least some of what I can give, uh, that uh, Mark's gospel teaches, in fact, insists upon the real, the full, the true humanity of Jesus. Often in debates of this sort, Muslims think it's sufficient to prove that Jesus prayed, that Jesus was hungry, that Jesus slept, that he wept, that he died, uh, uh, that he had these real human emotions, these real needs. Uh, and that, of course, is, is not at all adequate in terms of discounting the Christian position. The Christian position is that Jesus was a real human being. In fact, it's that he must have been a real human being, otherwise he wasn't our savior. We don't simply believe that Jesus was God, that he floated you know, four inches above the, the ground. He was a real human being. He walked and he sweat, uh, he even died. And so it won't be adequate for my opponent to try and argue against Christ's deity on the basis of verses that prove his humanity, which we accept and in fact insist upon as necessary to our very salvation. Uh, a second thing that I want to point out in this regard is that it won't be relevant for my opponent to point out differences between the wording, that is verbal variations between different Gospels, as if it's somehow relevant to undermining the case that I'm making from Mark's Gospel. Remember I, I said before that Muslims will sometimes argue on the basis of liberal scholarship that uh, we have an evolving Christology in the New Testament. And so they'll look at the Synoptic Gospels and they'll say, this variation in Matthew's account as opposed to Mark's, or this variation in wording in Luke's account as opposed to Matthew or Mark's, represents a change that's intended to prove something greater about Jesus than what Mark originally taught. Okay, it won't be relevant to showing that these people are upgrading Jesus if I can demonstrate that Mark, in the first place, teaches that Jesus is God. You can't have the later Gospels trying to upgrade Jesus by changing wording if Mark already teaches the full deity of Jesus Christ. I hope you understand the, the, the point here. The point is, if Mark already teaches it, then you can't say the later Gospels are now introducing it by means of these verbal variations. There are clear explanations for why there are variations in the wordings between the Gospels that we can get into if my opponent thinks it's still relevant. Um, but I just remind him there are verbal variations in the way the Quran explains certain stories. For example, the story of Moses in Surah 19, Surah 20, Surah 27, and 28. They all have different uh, wording in the accounts. Uh, even though they believe the essence of what took place is being communicated. Now, a third and final point that I want to make uh, relevant to this, before jumping right into Mark, is it's often thought that we can discount what Mark says on the basis of a priori considerations. It's believed that the Jews were Unitarian, that the Old Testament is Unitarian, that there's only one person who is God according to the Old Testament and according to the belief of ancient Jews, and they weren't expecting a divine Messiah. So the New Testament writers could not have been out of step with the Old Testament and ancient Judaism and taught that Jesus is God. Uh, now, I do agree that they're consistent with the Old Testament and they're consistent with true Judaism throughout the ages. But it's not true to say that Judaism has always been Unitarian. That is, in fact, a devolution of what uh, the Old Testament teaches and ancient Jews believe. Uh, in the first place, we know that ancient Jews would have, I mean, could have believed in the deity of Christ because the Old Testament says things that can be interpreted that way, even if you don't think in the final analysis they ought to be interpreted that way. You have statements in the Old Testament, for example, where it says that Jesus is, or the Messiah, the coming Messiah, will be Emmanuel, which means God with us, Isaiah 7, 14. You have him being referred to as El Gibor, the mighty God, in Isaiah 9, 6. He's referred to as Elohim, God, in Isaiah 45. God, your God, has anointed you above your companions. He's referred to as Yahweh, our righteousness. He's given the incommunicable name of God in Jeremiah 23. And he's referred to as the Lord in Malachi 3.1. It says that somebody will prepare the way for the Lord who will suddenly come to his temple. That phrase there, ha-adon, in Hebrew is only used for God. So the person whose way is being prepared by another, a voice crying out in the wilderness, as Isaiah calls him, 
that person who's coming is called the Lord. So the Jews could have interpreted verses from the Old Testament teaching uh, that the Messiah, the coming Messiah, is God. So you can't automatically assume when we come to the New Testament that this was not a possible interpretation uh, of what Jesus was saying. Moreover, we know that the Jews, in fact, were expecting, uh, some of them at least, were expecting a divine Messiah. Jacob Neusner, one of the most well-known uh, and widely celebrated scholars of ancient Judaism, in a book called Judaisms, notice the plural, and their Messiahs. What he's pointing out here by the title is that Jews have not been uniform in their understanding of the Messiah throughout the ages. But it's called Judaisms and their Messiahs at the turn of the Christian era. Here's what he states on page 275. Earlier systems of Judaism resorted to the myth, so he doesn't believe this, he resorted to the myth, they resorted to the myth of the Messiah as Savior and Redeemer of Israel, a supernatural figure engaged in political historical tasks as King of the Jews, even a God-man facing the crucial historical questions of Israel's life and resolving them, the Christ as King of the world of the ages and of death itself. So what Neusner is saying here is that ancient Jews believed in what he considers a myth, that the coming Messiah would be, in fact, a God-man, the king of the world and of the ages and of death itself. And so, uh, with that said, let me then turn to Mark's gospel. What does Mark's gospel, in fact, uh, teach us? Well, in, in the first place, I only have ten minutes. I guess I took more time than I should have with, with those introductory remarks. But in the first place, I'm just going to consider three titles from Mark's gospel uh, in terms of what he says about Jesus. In the first place, the most common title for Jesus, at least on Jesus' own lips, is surprisingly a title that is not used so much by Christians or even by the early church, but it was used by Jesus in the Gospels quite prolifically. And it's the title, Son of Man. Okay, this title uh, was Jesus' favorite self-designation. This title comes from the Old Testament, the book of Daniel, in chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. And I'll read the verse for you. It says, I kept looking, this is Daniel, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might worship him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Now, the interesting thing is what most people assume this title communicates is the humanity of Jesus. Even Christians think that's the primary uh, import or upshot of this title as it's used by Jesus. Now, it certainly does communicate that uh, the person being referred to in this way is a human being. But the startling thing is, and this is why Daniel is, is here in amazement uh, as he beholds this vision, is that this person who's being described as appearing in the form of a man is uh, in every other way described as being a divine person. Notice in the vision that Daniel has, this person, it says he, he saw one like a son of man, but he's riding the clouds of heaven. Over 70 times in the Old Testament, God is described as the one who rides the clouds like his chariots. That's never ascribed to anybody other than God. God alone is the one who rides the clouds. In fact, this was a direct, uh, uh, if you will, polemic against the ancient Near Eastern belief in Baal as the cloud rider. The, the ancient uh, Canaanites and so forth believed in a god named Baal, and they believed that he was the cloud rider. And so God claims the, to be the one who has authority over all the forces of nature and to be the one who is at work even in the movements of the clouds and everything else. He is the one uh, who rides the storms of judgment and uh, controls the affairs of the earth. He sits enthroned, right, and, and uh, does as he pleases. Well, that's, so that's the first thing. Daniel marvels at the fact that this person is riding the clouds of heaven, the glory clouds, and yet uh, is appearing like a human being. Secondly, we're told that he's given dominion and universal worship. And the word for worship here is a term that's only used for divine worship. We, won't, we can't uh, equivocate here on the term in the way some people would like to do and say that it just means homage or reverence. It's a term only used for divine worship. And finally, he's given everlasting dominion, an eternal kingdom over which he'll reign. Well, I better move on quickly here then. And by the way, just so my opponent might uh, have something of an analogy to this, in the Quran in Surah 2, 210, it speaks of Allah as the one who comes in the clouds. And so you have even in the Quran a recognition of this as a divine uh, activity. Okay, uh, moving on. Notice that Jesus in the Gospel then uh, refers to himself as the Son of Man several times over. In John, uh, Mark chapter 2, Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man, saying that he has the authority to forgive sins. 
The Jews rightly understand the claim that Jesus is making for himself and thus say that Jesus is guilty of blasphemy because who can forgive sins but God alone? The justification that Jesus gives is that he is the Son of Man. The Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. In Mark 2, 28, it's uh, that Jesus is responding to their charge that he's guilty of violating the Sabbath. And he does so on the grounds that the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. So he claims as the Son of Man to be Lord over a divine institution, namely the institution of the Sabbath. Finally, uh, final example, and there are many others in Mark, in Mark 14, 62, at his trial, Jesus is in fact condemned on the basis of his self-identification as the Son of Man. He's asked by the high priest, are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Notice, by the way, that the high priest assumes that God has a son. He's not a Muslim. He's assuming that God has a son. His problem is that this Jesus figure in front of him, this human being, is claiming to be that son. Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus replies to him quite categorically, I am, and you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. In other words, you're presently sitting in judgment on me, and in the future I'm going to sit in judgment on you. I'm going to be the one who exercises the final judgment. So Jesus, as the Son of Man, which is already, by means of the Old Testament, a divine title, uh, associated with divine prerogatives and functions, and even uh, receiving of worship, Jesus applies his title to himself in the course of claiming the right to forgive sins, which can only be done by God, the right to determine the Sabbath regulations and what's uh, appropriate on it, and even uh, the right of final judgment. All of these are clear indications of Christ's divinity. Uh, <coughs> moving on here, uh, Jesus refers to himself throughout Mark's Gospel as the Son of God. He's called the Son of God in Mark 3.11 and Mark 15.39, Son of the Most High God in Mark 5.7, the Son of the Blessed in Mark 14.61, the Son in Mark 13.32, and finally in Mark 1.11 and 9.7, by God the Father is referred to as my beloved Son, the Agapotes uh, Huyos. Uh, that phrase there indicates the uniqueness of Christ's Sonship. It won't be adequate for my opponent to say, this is not a divine title. It's not indicating his deity. Uh, because other people can be called sons. Sure, other people can be called sons in the Bible and are. We are considered sons of God, uh, according to the Bible. But Jesus is being referred to as God's son in a unique sense. We become sons by adoption, redemptively, through Christ. Jesus is his true son. That's why the words of God at his baptism are, This is my beloved son. Hear him, right? Listen to him. If it was referring to him as son in the same sense that everyone else is a son, well, first of all, why don't we hear God declaring that over us? Uh, no, there's something special about Jesus that's being marked out here. But the phrase agapetos huyos is a phrase that indicates the uniqueness, the exclusivity of this kind of sonship for Jesus. It's a term used in the Old Testament. It's translated from the Hebrew word yahid, right? When Isaac is referred to as Abraham's only son. In fact, what's interesting about this word throughout the Old Testament usage, it's always associated with the son who's uh, either been killed or his death is impending. So it's always referring, it's associated with a son who's uniquely a son in some way, uh, who's yet going to be uh, undergoing death. So Jesus is identified as that son as well. In the parable in Mark 12, Jesus distinguishes himself from the prophets by saying that God sent his servants the Jews treated them, you know, in one way and then in another, always, you know, in each case mistreating them, you know, beating them, killing them, and so forth. And then it says, finally God says, I will send my son. So the son is sent last of all and is thus considered to be greater than mere servants. So it's not being used in, in, a, in the sense of a mere servant or a righteous person. It's clearly being used in a divine sense. Um, and that's evident as well. We can look for all of this to the writings of Peter, where he also backs up each one of the points that I'm making from Mark's Gospel. Remember I said Peter stands behind Mark's Gospel, and so his testimony as well uh, helps uh, uh, support this. Uh, one final thing, one final comment that I'll make uh, is the title Lord. Okay, and I could go on with each one of these titles. The title Lord. The very opening of Mark's Gospel declares that Jesus is Yahweh. It says, in uh, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, right? Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one crying in the wilderness say, prepare ye the way of the Lord. If you go back to the Old Testament, Mark is actually taking two passages, and some would add a third, but he's, he's, he's doing what was typical of, of Jews in the first century, of associating passages that had these thematic and verbal links between them, and saying these are talking about the same thing. So he takes a passage from Isaiah, 
Isaiah 40, in a passage from Malachi 3, and he puts them together, because both are talking about somebody preparing the way for another. In Isaiah 40, the one whose way is being prepared is said to be God. Prepare in the desert a highway for our God. And then it says, all, all mankind is going to see the salvation of our God. Okay? So the person who's coming after the one who prepares the way is called God by Isaiah. And he's also referred to in the same context as Lord, which is the Hebrew word Yahweh. When you go to the Malachi passage, it's the passage I referred to earlier, uh, where it says that a messenger is going to prepare the way for the messenger of the covenant, also referred to as Ha-Adon, the Lord. And then it says, he will suddenly come to his temple. Okay, so whose temple was that over there in Jerusalem? It was the Lord's temple. Then there's only one Lord whose temple it was, Yahweh. So Jesus, in all these, in, throughout the gospel, again, he's referred to as Lord. Um, in fact, uh, well, I'll leave this for perhaps a rebuttal period. But he's, he's identified as Lord, and not just Lord in some ambiguous sense. You know, like you might say master. You might call master a Lord. He's being referred to as Lord in a religious sense, in a, in a heavenly sense, in the Old Testament sense that was exclusive to Yahweh. So by all these means, we see that Mark, the earliest gospel, the gospel that rests upon the testimony of Peter, a gospel that all the other gospel writers considered so significant, or at least Matthew and Luke, significant enough to base a large part of their own testimonies upon it, and thus it receives the stamp of approval of Matthew and Luke, and so on and so forth. That gospel clearly teaches the exalted character and, in fact, deity of Jesus, insofar as it identifies him as the divine Son of Man, who is worthy of universal worship, eternal dominion, uh, and also the Son of God, whom the God the Father himself declared from heaven to be his Son, and even the Lord, whose way was prepared uh, in the wilderness. Uh, thank you very much. Salam. I want to thank my friend apologist Mr. Rogers for his presentation this morning and continue uh, to faithfully represent Islam the straight path and invite the Christians uh, in the audience to uh, come join Allah and you will be pleased because he is most merciful. Um, I will deal with some of the things that Mr. Rogers has said in my rebuttal period but I want to make a case so the Christians can understand why we do not accept the deity of Jesus as commonly presented by Christian belief to help you see the truth about who Jesus is. By way of introduction, uh, most of you know the Muslims hold the Holy Quran in high esteem and honor. And it is the first place we go as it is a guardian over your book according to the Quran. We also sometimes look to the Hadith which are sayings of the Prophet Muhammad but today I will not get into these because it is not as a sure of a source and there is a Hadith science to know which ones are which. So I will be quoting from the Noble Quran from your Injil and then a little bit from Christian history. So what does the Noble Quran say about Jesus? whom we call Issa ibn Miriam, Masih, that is Jesus, son of Mary, the Messiah. There are 74 verses about Isa in the Noble Quran, and they say many positive things about him. However, they will never say he is God, because we believe in Tawid. This is the pure, clear oneness of God, the fact that he is only one. In fact, this is our most fundamental creed, the Shahada that we say, where we say and affirm the oneness of Allah. And uh, it seems as if your Bible agrees when you look at Deuteronomy 6.4, the ancient Shema of Israel. But first, to the Quran, who is Jesus? Well, he is a messenger, a servant, a man of Allah, but not God. Surah 3.59 says that Allah created Jesus like Adam. He said, be, and he was. Surah 5, 116 says, this is Jesus speaking now. Jesus says in the Noble Quran, To Allah, you know what is in my heart, though I do not know what is in yours. So, Jesus does not know Allah the same way that Allah knows him. If this is true, the concept of the Trinity would be false. And it seems there's even places in the Gospel, maybe where we see this, 
Because we see Jesus saying things that he doesn't know, that Allah seems to know. Surah 4, O people of the book, commit no excess in your religion. So let me explain that. Here we have Isa, who is a prophet, and that's good to affirm that. Thank you, Christians, for doing that. But you are innovating and committing excess by going past the point to say he is something other than what he is, which he would not want you to do. Nor say anything but the truth about Allah. The Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, was only a messenger of Allah, and his word which he conveyed to Mary, and a spirit from him. So believe in Allah and his messengers, and say not three, cease, it is better for you. Say not three refers to what might be called the tritheism of Christians. We understand they want to call it Trinitarianism, but to us it just looks like three gods. The tritheism, saying three, which one? cease, please, it is better for you Christians. Surah 517 says this, it is blasphemy indeed for you that say God is Christ. Do not say Christ is God. And Surah 575 makes a very important point when it speaks of Jesus and his mother and it says, they both used to eat food. They both used to eat food. Now there's nothing wrong with eating food, it's what us humans do. But if we think of God eating food, we think of him also needing to answer the call of nature. And I do not like thinking of God doing that. Why would you? And when I think about God who needs to eat, it almost seems to contradict what your Apostle Paul says when he's speaking to the people at Mars Hill and says, God's not served by human hands, he doesn't need anything, but yet here is this God who needs to eat and do other things associated with being human. How is that? Do you not have a contradiction by affirming Jesus is God? Please, repent of your excess and return to the straight path. Not only that, but the Quran understands that Allah has no son. Surah 21, 24-26 says, They say, the All-Merciful has taken a son. But this is not the case. Transcendent is Allah. Surah 23, 91, No son did Allah beget. Surah 1935, It is not befitting to the majesty of Allah that he should beget a son. Surah 930, The Christians call Christ the son of Allah, but Allah is cursed beyond them. So I am here today, humbly inviting you to Islam to avoid the penalty of this error. I would not be here if I did not care about you Christians. There are warnings here for you. Please heed them from the Noble Quran. Not only that, the very idea of the Trinity involves partnership or sharing or what some may call association. Well, this goes directly against also the Quran and gets into a egregious error called shirk. Allah has no partners. There is no trinity. Surah 448 says, Surely Allah will not forgive those who assign partners to Him. So here's Yahweh in the Old Testament. All of a sudden the Christians come along and they start adding two and three. Do not assign any partners to Allah, please. He forgives all but that to whom He pleases. Whoever ascribes partners to Allah is guilty of a monstrous sin. Surah 6, 163 says, No partner has he. This joining together with Allah, with men, is idolatry. And this goes against one of the Ten Commandments. Surah 5, 72, 73 says that, this is Jesus speaking. He says, The Messiah himself said, O children of Israel, worship Allah, my Lord and your Lord. Whoever ascribes partners to Allah, remember this is Jesus, Isa speaking, for him Allah has forbidden paradise. His abode is the fire. For the unjust there will be no helpers. They have disbelieved who say Allah is the third of three, when there is no God save one God. Allah will not forgive a mushrik, an idolater. Saying three Christians is an act of disbelief, kufr, according to the Quran. Now, as the noble Quran is uncorrupted in any way, and the word of God, I could end, but because I really want to see you come to the straight path of Islam, I will turn to your own Injil, to your own book, to help you see that 
what I am saying to you is true. And I mentioned some of these things, and I just ask you to consider these questions as I read some of these verses. Does God need to eat? Does He sleep? Does He need to sleep? Does He get tired? Does He get hungry? Does He cry? Does He use the restroom? Or, God forbid, does He suckle at a woman's breast? I say no, I'm embarrassed to even say it. We see the Shema saying, Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God, Yahweh is one. But the Christians want to say, Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God, Yahweh is three. But even in your Injil, John 1.18 says, No one has ever seen God. And I know you guys believe that people saw Jesus. John 4.24, Jesus is speaking to the woman at the well. He says, God is spirit. But yet there he is in front of her. Which one is it? Isaiah 40, 13, 25, going back when Yahweh is speaking about himself, he says, Who is my equal? Says the Holy One. You Christians want to say Jesus is his equal. John 14, 28, Jesus continues to speak this way about his relationship with Allah, where he says, The Father is greater than I. That doesn't sound like he's equal, and yet the Gospel of John is where you Christians like to turn to say, Look, the deity of Christ. But in the Gospel of John, we see, no, not the deity of Christ. John 5.30 also has Jesus saying, I can do nothing on my own. How is God going to say this? I can do nothing on my own? This is God? And leaving John to Mark, which Mr. Rogers liked, Mark 10.18 says, When a man came to Jesus and says, What much should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, because a man called him good teacher, Jesus says, Why do you call me good? Ask the man that question. He says, no one is good except God alone. Why would Jesus say that? Shouldn't he say something like, yes, I am good because I am also good, or I am also God. He does not say this. Now, when I look at the crucifixion account that you have in places like Matthew and Mark, I see Jesus on the cross saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, how is it that God is saying to God, God, why are you leaving me? How is it that God is praying to God in the garden before this crucifixion? Is he God or is he not? How is God leaving himself? And while God is dead, according to you Christians, from the crucifixion, who is running the universe for those three days? Did everything fall apart? No, because Jesus is not God. It's even embedded in your own scripture if you would just please be able to see now Psalm 147, 5 says that Yahweh's understanding has no limit. And yet in Mark 13, 32, Jesus says concerning the day or the hour that I return, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, not even the Son, only the Father. Now I ask you some questions. He mentioned Mark. But do you know in Mark 1, 11, Jesus talks, he's at his baptism and a voice from heaven says, this is my beloved Son. Are you guys aware that many Christians throughout the ages have thought, that's when Jesus became God, is at his baptism. It's called adoptionism. So, is that when it happened? It seems as if Christians can't decide. And then you have other questions that I would raise up from the Gospels himself. Jesus goes to a fig tree, thinks it's going to be food on it. There's not. Wouldn't God know there's no food in the fig tree? Why does he get upset and curse it? Jesus is in a crowd, doesn't know who touched him. How is this that God doesn't know who touched him? How is that? Now, when I look at this, many questions arise, and I'll try to finish by time answering a few things that Anthony said with the rest of my time. I am glad, first of all, that he admits Matthew, Luke, and John contradict each other, and that they have been revised, and he stuck to Mark. That is good to see a Christian apologist admit this. And it's funny, Christians, whenever they we quote a scholar who's a Christian scholar at a Christian school, they say, oh, he's liberal. So apparently to you Christians, anyone who you don't agree with, that's the liberal. But how does that work? You just get to decide who's who? And when I, when I listen to what Mr. Anthony Rogers said, he brings up the Quran and conflicting accounts, he says, but need I remind you, the Quran is not the point of the debate. The question is, Jesus, God, why is he trying to distract you by bringing up the noble Quran? The point of the debate is, Jesus, God. And he quotes 
a Jewish scholar who even says these Messiah things are myths. Why quote this man? Isn't there someone better that you can be quoting? Now, when he returns to Daniel 7 and talks about this son of man, I ask you, is that how the Jews interpret Daniel 7? They didn't seem to think that applied to Jesus. Why did the Christians get to and, and, and kind of invent their own exegesis of the Jewish scriptures? And in Mark 2, when Jesus forgives sins, yes, okay, by the permission of Allah, just like the way he did miracles. We believe in the virgin birth. We believe in the resurrections Jesus performed. We believe in many miracles that Jesus performed. They're all by the permission of Allah. This is acceptable. And in fact, don't some of you Christians believe that Catholic priests can forgive sins still today? Are they God? I hope not. So, I ask you to consider these things. And, and um, even when we talk about Mark, Number, a number of times he says that Peter is the source behind Mark. How does he know that? I don't see it in Mark. How do we know that? I don't know that. I want to know, is that really the case? Besides, the copies are so much later and there's conflicts anyway. Peter's the source of Mark. Tell me how you know this. And lastly, a point about Lord, the Greek word kyrios. Um, this word, if you look in your own Bibles... In Greek, it can be translated not only to Lord, but to Sir. In fact, Caesar was called Lord. Christians don't think Caesar was God, surely. So, these semantic games don't negate the clear teaching of the Noble Quran, the clear teaching of the Hebrew Scriptures. And I ask the Christians again to repent of the error that they have believed in and return to the straight path that is Islam affirming there is only one God, Allah, the most merciful. Thank you. I have five minutes. I think I have done my job. That is enough. You, the Christian will have his hands full with that. Thank you. All right, I have ten short minutes to respond to a lot of error. Uh, let me begin with this. Number one, I didn't say that the Gospels contradict one another. My opponent, the only contradiction here is my opponent contradicting my opening statement. I said that verbal variations do not constitute uh, legitimate grounds for claiming that these stories are being misrepresented or that they're presenting different Christologies or different messages. You can express the same truth in different words. If I say Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, that just because somebody else comes along and says Lazarus was raised by Jesus from the dead, which is different syntax, doesn't mean that they're communicating a different idea. It's the same idea. You can have the essence of something communicated even if you don't have the same wording. The reason for bringing up the Quran was not because I'm trying to deflect your attention from the purpose of this debate. In fact, if bringing up the Quran's verbal variations in its accounts of the same story uh, is an attempt to deflect uh, your attention from what's really on uh, our topic, then my opponent is guilty of violating his own strictures. How many times did he bring up the Quran in this debate tonight? I thank him for admitting to me that the Quran is irrelevant in terms of dis uh, determining the deity of Christ. So let's then go to the New Testament. And I'd love to talk about all those verses he quoted from the Quran, but uh, he's already just basically handed to me uh, all, th all that I need to just throw it off the table. Uh, when it comes to the Gospel of Mark, is it reliable? He says, well, how do we know it's written on the basis? Well, first of all, you have to understand that this is the traditional position, that it's based on the, uh, the memoirs of Peter. If he disagrees with the long-standing traditional view, then it's really on him to prove that that's not the case. Okay, we don't have to keep reinventing the wheel. If something is established, and if anybody wants to, you know, overturn previously believed views, then he is... But the onus is on them to show us that we shouldn't be doing it this way anymore. But in fact, all of the early reports tell us that it was based on the writings of Peter. There's not a single peep of any other idea than that in the early sources that we have. And so on the basis of the historical information we have, there's no other way to go than to say it's based on the writings of Peter. Uh, so what then about, what did he say? Uh, he tried to, uh, I guess, uh, preempt uh, or anticipate his rebuttal uh, by addressing some things that I said in Mark. Uh, what I found really interesting was his, first of all, he went more to the Gospel of John than he did to Mark, uh, which is highly interesting. Uh, remember, uh, it's just as relevant to John as it is to Mark, that I said that as a Christian, I don't only believe that Jesus is God, I also believe he's a real human being, which means that he went to the bathroom, which means that he slept, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. 
Uh, his only response to that was, he can't imagine that, he doesn't like that. Well, I don't like onions, and yet uh, sometimes I find it in my food at home, because my wife likes onions. <laughs> Now, often she, you know, considers my taste buds and doesn't put it in there when she would rather have it. But sometimes it still makes it in because it just can't have a meal without it, she says. Uh, well, the fact that we don't like certain things doesn't mean it's not true. In fact, this is the height of irrationality to think that we can simply pull the covers over our head anytime we don't like something. That's what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that Jesus is not only God, but also a human being. And therefore, he had... Uh, things true about him that were also true of human beings. He was like us in terms of his deity, and I mean, like us in terms of his humanity, and like his father in terms of his deity. That means that we should also expect to find two sets of attributes and characteristics. We should expect Jesus to be omniscient, omnipotent, and omnibenevolent, and also for him to be limited to, in time and space, to need food, and to be hungry, and to sleep. Uh, all, all those verses that he quotes are irrelevant to overturning the deity of Christ or the Christian position, the whole of which is that Jesus is both God and man. So you can't refute the whole of our position by only bringing up half of what our scriptures teach. Our scriptures teach that he was not only God, but also a man. Uh, that's why Jesus could say, in, in fact, he said if Jesus was God, he would know the hearts of people. He would know the heart of Allah and so forth. He quoted Surah 5, 116, where it says, You know what's in my heart, I don't know what's in yours. I thank him for admitting that that's a characteristic of deity. Because in Mark 2, which I quoted, where Jesus said uh, to the, the paralytic man, Son, your sins are forgiven you, which provokes the response by the Pharisees, uh, you know, who do you think you are? You're a mere man, and yet you're claiming the prerogatives of God to forgive this guy's sins. In that very context, it says that Jesus knew what they were reasoning in their hearts. Mark 2, he said this was a, a, a clear indication of deity. This would be true of Jesus if he was God. Well, there it is, right there in Mark's Gospel. Uh, the fact that he also uh, could say that he doesn't know everything is because he's also a real human being. Jesus had divine attributes. He had human attributes. I admit that's paradoxical. I admit that's difficult. But that doesn't mean it's not right there, that it's not what Jesus taught. And he admits that he's a prophet, so he's obligated to believe what he said. Uh, let me just go over some of these things from, from John in the short time I have. Uh, in John 1.18, he says, uh, John 1.18 says that Jesus is not God because it says no one has ever seen God. Did, did he realize there's another half to that verse? It says, no man has seen God at any time, but God, the one and only who's at the Father's side, he has made him known. Jesus, in the second half of the verse, is identified as God and as the one who exegetes God, according to the Greek. He's the one who makes him known. By becoming flesh, Jesus visibly reveals his Father. Because he's one in essence with the Father, Jesus, as God, can be said to be uh, a, a, a manifestation and a revelation of the Father. In fact, he says the same thing later in John's Gospel, doesn't he? In John 14, he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Because Thomas wants uh, you know, more than what he sees in Jesus. And Jesus is saying, I'm sufficient for you, Thomas. In John chapter 1, verse 1, the same gospel, this prologue, the same chapter, it calls Jesus God. It says, Kai theos ain halagos, and God was the Word. Jesus is referred to as the Word. In verse 14, it says, the Word became flesh. In fact, it says, and uh, made his, uh, it says the, uh, we beheld his glory, the glories of the one and only from the Father, full of grace and truth. It says that he... Uh, became flesh and dwelt among us. The literal Greek there uh, harkens back to the Old Testament where it speaks of God's glory dwelling in the tabernacle. It says that the word became flesh and tabernacled among us in the literal Greek. Uh, it's the word from which we get Shekinah, right? Shekinah glory. It refers to the glory of God dwelling among men. Jesus throughout John is referred to as God. For somebody to miss that, uh, I mean, it's not surprising. If you can miss it in John, you could miss it in Mark. Uh, and my opponents demonstrated that he can miss it where it's obvious. He said, John 14, 28, Jesus says, the Father, uh, the Father is greater than I am. Uh, the, the lexical sources indicate that this word has two uh, different uh, meanings, and we have to determine from context and, and uh, immediate and broader what that meaning uh, that we select for is. It could either mean that a person is greater in nature and power or in position, right? Remember, I believe as a Christian that Jesus humbled himself. He humbled himself uh, to the Father and took on himself the role of a servant and of a human being and he lived a real human life because we never lived it. He had to live it in our place. He had to be the perfect servant that Adam wasn't and that none, nobody else in history and ourselves included ever was. So he had to be that perfect human being which required humbling himself to God. He even submitted himself to the law. He submitted himself to Mary and Joseph. Does he believe that Joseph and Mary are greater than Jesus? 
in terms of uh, uh, his person and character? No, he doesn't believe that. But he does believe in terms of his position, his role, that he's lesser than Mary and Joseph. Uh, he said in John Mark 10, 18, Jesus says, Why do you call me good? So uh, apparently, according to my opponent, Jesus was denying his essential goodness. Is that what Jesus is doing there? No, he's not making a positive statement there. He's asking a question. It's rhetorical. Why do you call me good? That is not the same thing as saying, do not call me good, or I am not good. If my children come to me and, you know, uh, say something, I might say, you know, uh, what, uh, what do you think daddy's going to say? You know, I mean, the, the fact that you ask a rhetorical question uh, doesn't mean that you're making a positive assertion. Uh, so that's simply a mistake on my opponent's part. And the Gospels clearly make uh, Jesus' goodness clear. Jesus is referred to throughout Mark's Gospel as the Holy One. Even the demons recognize that he's the Holy One. I invite my opponent to at least catch up with the demons. Uh, he said that Jesus in uh, Mark 1.11 became the Son of God. He says that many people thought this, that this was when Jesus became the Son, the adoptionism. Because in Mark 1.11, God says, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So some people are saying that Jesus became the Son at his baptism. And he rightly said that in history, this heresy was known as adoptionism. Okay? The problem is, if you interpret the words that way, then you have Jesus becoming the Son in all kinds of different places. Right? It's not just at his baptism that Jesus is declared by the Father from heaven to be his Son. Later, at the transfiguration on the mountain, the Father, speaking of the Son, says, This is my beloved Son. Hear him. Did he become his son then again at the transfiguration? I mean, how many times did he become God's son? Did God change his mind several times? What kind of a God is it that my opponent believes in? That his interpretation forces him to think that God is uh, playing musical chairs here, or he loves me, he loves me not, or something. You know, he's my son, he's not my son, he's my son, he's not my son. No, the gospel testimony is that Jesus is his beloved son. He's not becoming his son. This is a declaration of what is true of Jesus in terms of his essential nature. And it's true of Jesus uniquely. We become God's sons by adoption, according to the Bible. Romans 8, in several other passages. Galatians 4, he pours forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, right? The spirit of adoption. Jesus is not adopted. Jesus is his son. This is God's son. Hear him. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. I want to continue to give praise to Allah, the most merciful. Um, um, a few things. I'll try to deal with as many points as I can, not necessarily in order because of the, the nature of the presentation. But uh, my opponent says that we know Peter was the source behind the Gospel of Mark uh, due to Christian tradition. Uh, does anyone in this room accept everything based on Christian tradition? I thought you guys believed in sola scriptura. And uh, if you hold that Christian tradition is authoritative, then I would also like to ask, how many of you baptize babies? Probably none of you, being that this is a Baptist church. So the Christian tradition argument is fallacious and gets us nowhere when we ask, who is the source behind Mark? And... Um, there's a few verses that I did not get to bring up uh, that help continue to help negate the idea of Jesus, a mere man being God, such as clear verses in the Old Testament we find, and you guys probably remember these, God is not a man that he should lie. Uh, God is not a man. Now, my opponent says we expect Jesus to have these characteristics of deity, and one of the omnis he mentions is omniscient. And yet we turn around and have Jesus saying, who touched me, which my opponent could not answer, and I don't know when I'm coming back. This does not sound like omniscience to me. And sometimes um, you will hear, hear apologists say, oh, it's paradoxical or something. In fact, he used that word once during his presentation. But to the Muslim ear, paradoxical, when talking about the deity of a man or any such nonsense, just sounds like illogical, irrational. Islam is totally true. Allah is truth. There is no illogic. It is simple truth. And that's why millions of people all over the world continue to accept Islam and his prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Now, my opponent brought up a few verses that I need to point out some things that not many Christians are aware of. And it is not my intention to disregard the, the Injil or to uh, make you... Um, uh, scared, but I, I do need to bring these up for the sake of honesty. 
I hold in my book a hand called A Textual Commentary on the Greek New Testament by Bruce Metzger, who by any account is not a liberal scholar. And in here, he lists all the places where the Bible has what you Christians call textual variants. We just call them mistakes. John 1.18, for example, which he quoted as a rebuttal to something that I brought up, actually has an important textual variant, which if you ever listen to Dr. James White, who lives somewhere in Phoenix, has brought up on his radio show, The Dividing Line, he's talked about this textual variant. So, at least some Christians are aware, but I don't think quite enough are aware. Did you know that in John 1.18, the very place where he referred to Monogonos Theos, the one and only God. Some of your manuscripts right here tell me that other manuscripts say the one and only Son. They do not say the one and only God in some of your manuscripts in John 1.18. Which is it? Cannot Allah preserve His word if this is His word? What has happened to the Christian Bible? There is also another important one in Mark. Mark chapter 1. And in Mark 1, he mentioned how he says it begins with uh, affirming the deity of Jesus, and he referred to Mark 1, where it says, the Son of God. However, as I turn to Mark 1, and it mentions what are some of the textual variants there, I see that some manuscripts do not have Son of God in them. There's an absence of it. And this is information that you guys can find for yourself, and I encourage you to do so. Now, even if Jesus is the Word of God, aligned with John, uh, this does not mean necessarily that he is God, because us, Muslims, believe that Jesus is indeed the Kalimat Allah, the Word of God. But we don't think he's God, so it is possible to believe Jesus is the Word of God without affirming that he is God, and we do so. And I ask you, yes, D. Dot first said this, and it still has not been answered 40, 50 years later, when he says, if it is so obvious, just show us in the place in the Injil where Jesus says, I am God, worship me. Why all the interpreting and twisting? Just show us. The debate could be over. He could just show us right here. Jesus says, I am God, worship me. Then we go home. But that's not the case. And in fact, Thomas is saying to Jesus, show us the Father. If Thomas does not know Jesus is God, after all this time... How are we, 2,000 years removed away from the situation, reading in a book about this man, supposed to know that he is definitively God? It's a bit confusing, perhaps because Christians have confused the issue, because Jesus is not God. In fact, even this title, Son of Man, that he brought up, let's think about Son of Man, what it literally means. Let's just use common sense here. Son of Man means you are a son of a man. It just means you're a human male. That's all it means. Why attach theological significance to it? This is a, a humble way that a lost slave, which Esau was, peace be upon would refer to himself. Then my opponent says, no, the demons, listen to the demons. A Christian is telling me to listen to the demons. Why? I thought that they were liars and deceivers. Why am I listening to the demons for my Christology? I am not. I am listening to Allah and his apostle Muhammad from the most noble Quran. Now, a few things about Christian history and what's going on now. It is very difficult when you say, believe this about Jesus, and I look around and I see Mormons, and I see Jehovah's Witnesses, and I see Unitarians, and I look back in church history and I see Gnostics, and Arians, and Nestorians. No one can agree on who Jesus is, what he's doing, what it means to say he's the Son of God. Is he part of three? No one can agree, and yet the Christian apologist says, here, read this book, yes he is. If the Christians cannot agree, why are we supposed to say, oh yes, it looks like it to be, whose interpretation should we accept, and from which Bible, and from which Gospels? Do you Christians not know that the Gospels that you read are brought to you in 325 at the Council of Nicaea, from Constantine, the Roman Emperor, who also essentially invented the deity of Jesus on that day in a place in ancient Turkey? One day Jesus is a man, a prophet, highly esteemed, certainly. The next day, Jesus is God. An overnight transformation. But is that even what your angel says? And we know for certain, the guardian, the protector of your angel, the noble Quran, does not say that. So again, I ask Christians to return. Let me finish with one last thing, a textual variant that I forgot to bring up. It's true he did not bring this up, 
But sometimes I hear it used by people. Sometimes these are guys who call themselves King James only advocates. They will quote to me 1 John 5, 7. There are three that testify in heaven, and these three are Father, Son. Do Christians not know that this is inserted into your Bible thousands of years later? It doesn't exist as a verse, 1 John 5, 7. It shouldn't be in there. And I ask you, if it's so clear Jesus is God and there's three, whatever, persons, substances, essences, I don't know, it sounds like Greek philosophy to me, then why make up a verse, Christians? Why not just let it stand as is and why quote this to the Muslim in a debate? Are you trying to deceive us? I hope not. Now, there are more things to say, but... I again ask you to consider the clear testimony of the Quran, and he says, why did I bring up the Noble Quran? Because the Quran, unlike your Bible, which your own scholars admit, does not have all the corruptions. It's a pure book. It is the guardian, the protector, the keeper of the Injil. We can trust it as safe. I quote it, so it helps us see the things that are in the Bible, we interpret it through the proper lens of the Quran. The things that are clearly contradictory, we just realized this must have been some of the corruption, and we cannot hold to those things. That's why the Noble Quran is relevant in a debate about, is Jesus God? Because as the Word of God, it certainly has something to say about the question of Isa, because he is mentioned. And so again, I ask you Christians to please avoid hellfire, avoid the confusion of more than one God, avoid the confusion of a confusing, corrupted book, avoid all that and return to the clear simplicity the path of Islam, and follow the model of the Prophet Muhammad. Peace be upon him. Thank you. By way of conclusion, there's a lot to be said. Let's just rehearse some of the things that we've already seen, the errors my opponent has made uh, and has not uh, re recovered from. Uh, in my positive case, I pointed out that Jesus in the earliest gospel uh, teaches the deity of Christ by means of three titles, Son of Man, Son of God, and Lord. With respect to the Son of Man title, you heard my opponent say, what does that word, the phrase mean, the title, Son of Man? Let's just use common sense. Why give it theological significance? Well, the, the obvious reason for giving it theological significance is because the only way you can properly interpret something is by taking into account its a situation like that is where it was revealed, when it was revealed, the context of it, the historical context. Okay, this, the context of this is first century uh, Judaism. And so we therefore have to go to first century Jewish sources to determine the meaning of this title. The Son of Man title comes from Daniel, where it's given theological significance, not common sense significance. What was common to the understanding of the Jews at that time is not what's common to the Muslim mind. They thought that it was a divine title. He said, uh, you know, we mentioned uh, Neusner. He says, why bring this guy up? You know, why, uh, why are you quoting this guy? He says all this stuff is myth. My point was that you can't discount the idea that the New Testament writers identify Jesus as God on the grounds that the uh, earlier Jews didn't believe that the coming Messiah would be God. Whether Neusner believes that he would be God or not is irrelevant. Neusner's commenting on the fact that ancient Jews expected a divine Messiah. So it's clear that when Jesus steps on the scene in the first century, that idea could have been one of the things that they uh, would have expected about Jesus, and it would have to be determined based on the Messiah's own words if, in fact, that was true. It wasn't ruled out in advance by them. The title, Son of God, he made the fallacious argument that Jesus was adopted as God's Son on the basis of Mark 1.11. Uh, he's, uh, I showed how that's not the case because, again, he's referred to as God's Son from heaven uh, in Mark 9, where we have the transfiguration. Numerous times Jesus is called God's Son. These aren't mul multiple adoptions unless God's schizophrenic or changing his mind or what have you. With respect to the title Lord, uh, I don't recall that we got an answer from that. Oh, yeah, we did. We did hear him say that the term Lord could simply mean sir and so on and so forth. I already responded to that. I pointed out that it doesn't simply mean master. It's coming from the Old Testament where the underlying Hebrew term is not a term used indiscriminately for God and men, for human masters and so forth. It's the incommunicable name Yahweh, a name used for God and God alone. As well in Malachi 3.1, which Mark also quotes, the phrase is ha and all. That phrase is used only a handful of times, always only for God. It uses the definite article, ha adon. It's, it's very clear. can't be referring to anybody else. In fact, it says in the prophecy that he's coming to his temple. Whoever this Lord is who's coming is obviously the Lord God. That's his temple in Jerusalem, not somebody else's. He misunderstood or at least misrepresented my point about the demons. I said, you should catch up with the demons. He's telling me I say that means 
He should listen to the demons. Well, when the demons agree with God, there's a good indication of when we should listen, or at least catch up with them. The, de the, the demons believe, as Satan does, that there's only one God. It says that Satan believes that and trembles. The Quran says it. he believes that. Does he reject the, the, the idea that there's only one God because Satan believes it? No, that wasn't the point of my argument. Uh, so we've got a lot of problems here. I didn't hear anything adequate by way of rebuttal of my position. Let me go over some of the things he said. He misunderstood the point about the early testimony to the authenticity of Mark's gospel, that it's based on the memoirs of Peter. Uh, my argument was, my response to him was that he has to give positive reasons for not accepting it, since that is the longstanding tradition. Uh, I wasn't saying that tradition's infallible. There are all sorts of traditions we don't accept, but there are traditions that we do accept. There were traditions Jesus accepted in the first century. Jesus went to synagogue. There's no statement in the Old Testament that you have to go to synagogue, right? There, there's no teaching about synagogue in the Old Testament. The question is whether or not something is in conformity with Holy Scripture. There's nothing out of accord with Holy Scripture about setting up synagogue and going to synagogue. So uh, that's not a disproof of the evidence I gave for Peter's uh, witness behind the gospel. But Richard Bauckham, to give you one scholar who uh, supports this internally from the New Testament, points out the inclusion of, of eyewitness testimony that appears in Mark's gospel, which indicates that it was, in fact, based on the testimony of Peter, and I don't have time to go into all of that. He mentions various textual variants. He mentions John 1.18. Yeah, the same source he's looking at will tell you that John 1.18 has the strongest manuscript support, uh, the, the, the phrase, uh, the, uh, the unique God, the one and only God used for Jesus in John 1.18 is the strongest manuscript evidence uh, that we have is for that reading. But even the other reading, Monogenes Huyas, the one and only Son, still discounts my opponents because Jesus is being referred to as the divine Son, the unique Son. Monogenes, the term, it's, it's uh, synonymous with the term Mark uses, agapitos. Mark uses, or John uses monogenes, and it means the unique, the one and only Son of God, who fully and perfectly reveals the Father. He says in John 14, if Thomas uh, didn't understand that Jesus was God at this point, how are we expected to? Well, Thomas got the point, consequent upon seeing the resurrected Christ, and thus falling at his feet, saying, my Lord and my God. Okay, this is the part where I'm no longer Jamar Sadat, and I'm supposed to take five minutes as my real self, as a, a Christian, to say a few things. First of all, I pray that what I just did does not cause any Christian to lose their faith. However, I would not be scared if it, I would not be worried, in fact, I would be glad if it caused Christian's audience to challenge themselves to examine their own faith better and to understand the Islamic position well enough to argue from it without merely, without merely just making a caricature of it. Um, now, what did I do there, or try to do, uh, by, in the way of trying to faithfully represent what an Islamic apologist might do? Now, first of all, some of what I did, in, in my humble opinion, a little more advanced than a lot of Islamic apologists actually go, uh, by getting into textual variants in a significant way without kind of just throwing them around as a fact, without really getting into them. That's an example, I think. Um, that, that, but the thing is that the, the Quran, despite the fact that Islamic apologists will always say that it's unvarnished and untarnished, it is not true that it has a pure textual record. It has a worse textual record than the Bible for a number of reasons. One is the earliest copies were all burnt by Uthman, so our first copies of the Quran are not the earliest copies because Uthman burnt them all. Now, why would Uthman need to burn them all? if they all said the same thing as the ones he possessed after he made master copies. It would only stand a reason he burnt them because they did not say the same thing as the copies that he held on to from that point on. So there's a centralized control in early Islamic history because of the number of variations. Now we just don't know what's there. That's a real issue. Further, textual criticism in Christianity is much further developed because we allow people to have access to these. Not so with the Quran. It's all hidden, it's tucked away, guys have to sneak in and sneak out ph photographs under pain of death and all kinds of other stuff because it's not open. So it's not a highly developed uh, field yet because of the nature of Islam and not only are they not allowed to question the veracity of the Quran in Islam, it's actually a sin punishable by death if someone was to be able to discern that you were thinking about it not being accurate. So. The nature of Islamic dogma prevents any kind of real scholarship in this area. And so, 
the Islam can kind of point out these, the Muslim opponent can kind of point out these things, but it's uh, from a biased perspective. It's not using the same standard by which to judge the Quran as which he judges Christian scripture. Uh, one other thing I did that um, is common in most of these debates, besides using a double standard, that's a big one, is uh, this happens a lot. I don't know if it's language or rhetorical tactics, but there's a lot of misunderstanding about what the Christian says. So the Christian says one thing, usually the apologist on the Islamic side doesn't understand the nuance of it or actually understand the import of it for whatever reason. They kind of reinterpret it in a garbled way and then use it as a debate point. But you have to be aware, or be aware of when that is happening. Because if you're just kind of there taking it all in, it can happen pretty quick and pretty fast and you may not realize that's not what the guy said. He didn't understand the point. He's actually, it, 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 that, that commonly happens all the time. And another thing I did is you notice I just brought out a ton of information all at once. There's a ton of questions that no one could possibly answer in five minutes. You know, it would take a certain amount of time to answer each question faithfully. But that's not a real debate tactic that, that has merit because it's like you're just throwing these things out but you're not really expecting or giving your opponent a chance to answer them. But that is how the debates go. So we can't sort of just whine about it or expect it not to happen. We have to realize this will happen and then we hopefully hone in on what's most important and discuss that to really kind of get at the big ideas of the big picture is hopefully what we could do. Um, so again, I wanted to try to be faithful as I could with my knowledge at this time. I, I, uh, I hope no one got too mad at me while I was doing that. I promise that there is a good answer for all those things. And the real issue is, uh, on the Islamic side, there are no answers for even bigger questions uh, when we get into the Quran being the Word of God and its understanding of what the Injil is or isn't, the nature of the Trinity, who Jesus is. There's huge problems there with the Quran and even in modern day Islamic orthodoxy and practice, but we didn't have time to do those. Anyone has questions? Um, the Trinity that he said that the, uh, the Quran is against, what Trinity that that was? That the Quran said, no, which Trinity that was? Is it the same Trinity? If I was an Islamic apologist, I would say, I don't know, you tell me, or something like that. Well, you read it in the Quran. <laughs> read it in the Quran. Right. The, what I think Pastor Jabal is probably referring to, the, the Quran, whenever it says three, it never gives a definition of the three persons. And the only time when it's speaking of the nature of the Godhead that it does give three people, the three people are Jesus. the Father, the Son, and Mary. So it well, seems as if that's who they believe the Trinity is. And you may say, huh, well, but here's the thing. Let's just say the Trinity was a false doctrine. Obviously it's not. It answers lots of questions, which we don't have time to show. But it seems like Allah would know what the false doctrine was in order to properly critique it. But apparently Allah was confused about what the Trinity was at the time. He just kind of left out the Holy Spirit. Maybe Muhammad walked into an ancient church and saw statues of Mary because that was going on in that region. Unfortunately, there was a lot of heresy in the Arabian Peninsula by Christians. And he said, oh, look, there's the Son, there's the Father, and there's Mary. The Holy Spirit usually is not represented visibly in the same way, and so he gets left out of the picture. But yeah, there's not an accurate understanding of what the Trinity even is. And then the other, the other question that I have, the other question that I have is the authoritative, the authoritative power of the Quran. Noble Quran, based on what? Who said it is the Word of God? Who said it? God said it. <laughs> right, going back to the Trinity question, if I can throw some points in here. Uh, the, the verse literally says, say not three. It doesn't say, say not Trinity. And in fact, uh, I saw Yusuf Ali's copy here. It says, say not Trinity in Yusuf Ali's translation, but that's not what the Arabic says. It says, say not three. Three what? Three gods. Uh, I mean, if it's just say not three, I, there's one, uh, several Muslim apologists really, in order to get out of the conundrum that this creates, because it seems to misrepresent the Christian doctrine of God, he says that it just means say not three in any sense, right? Whatever you mean by Trinity, three gods, three people, you know, three persons, three this, three that, whatever you mean by three, Allah's not that, okay? Well, here's the problem. Allah is said to have 99 names and attributes. So what, say not three, but say 99? That's better. That's that's uh, you know. So I mean, there's there's problems here. I think uh, uh, 
for, for the Quran when it comes to that. Historical problems, uh, questions of uh, uh, logic and questions of theology and all that. But as far as who says the Quran is the word of God, I, that's one thing Muslims have found are the... Uh, they won't defend the Quran for the most part, but it's always taken as a given. They just they just always want to assume it. They always want to assume it. The Bible's in question. The Quran's not in question. The Bible's in question. The Quran's not in question. They try and keep it that way as much as they can. And when they give you arguments for the Quran, they usually give you ridiculous arguments, like uh, it's got the most perfect Arabic and, and that sort of thing. But uh, yeah, uh, what a Lewis. Yo, uh... Is there a consensus amongst Muslims concerning these issues? As far as their belief systems are, is, are, are they united in their theology? What should we expect? Muslims portray themselves as united in the, uh, their theology. Uh, but, you know, when you actually get into it, I mean, that's part of the reason why they fight so much is because they're not united in their belief systems. I mean, you can see in their own hadith the history of some of these fights. So no, they're not. In a certain sense, I would say there is a certain kind of superficial unity, though, because uh, as Islam pervades societies and it's sort of a cultural norm, everyone says I'm a Muslim, and they kind of have these basic, simple things they're dogmatic about. But going any deeper than that, about what it means or anything underneath that, there's almost nothing there often. Uh, unfortunately, there's Christians the same way, but you could say it's really long or stretched out but doesn't go down very deep so there's sort of a superficial unity based upon a few couple few points you can agree on but then it's kind of like what does that mean what are the implications of that that's where it gets crazy and weird and the scholars do a lot of debating back and forth and so we have to ask the question who's islam because i would say the contradictions the big contradictions are built into the quran itself for example is the Quran eternal? Has it always existed? That was a big debate in early Islam. It was a viable uh, option at one point to say no, it wasn't. But then it became to where you could die if you said that no, it wasn't eternal. But then if the Quran is eternal, how is it not God? They have the word of God that is eternal, but it's not a lot, but it's existing with them at all times. What is that? How is it? So there's issues there with the position they end up accepting. So. Yes, in a superficial sense, but no, in a, in a deeper sense, that would be what I would say. I would say also, whoever from the Muslim criticized the Quran stayed alive. Who? Hmm. It wasn't killed or poisoned. Who, who stood there? The guys who live in America, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's true. True. That's the only one. Or who do so anonymously. Yeah. Uh, I write Just for, for the fact that there is different denominations, that is a, 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 a good point to say that, hey, if you disagree, that's okay, go ahead. Give us, give us your best. Hmm. And the best is not a best. It's not even, it doesn't even come close to reality. And, uh, and of course, the result is, is shown. But again, the, be the best the answer to Islam is to change lives and the church that act God. I think that is the answer to Islam and to the world. The change of a man after 40 years of being crippled and the gate beautiful could not be argued about. They were put in prison, they were threatened, but there was a proof fact that they couldn't rebuttal that. They couldn't say Jesus is not alive and what. And so the argument for us as a, as, a, as a Christians is the proof evidence of our lives and to represent Christ and God the same as the first church did. I would say that, I mean, we are sometimes, I think, reticent to say certain things because we know that Muslims are going to resist that. We know that it's foolishness to them. We know that it's offensive. But it's those very things that God says is the power uh, of God unto salvation. And so, along with that, I would say that we need to proclaim the message that changes lives, which is the gospel. Apart from that, even our changed lives won't matter to them, and apart from the spirit applying it, that won't matter either. Uh, so, I mean, I think, hand in hand, we preach the, the gospel and uh, demonstrate in our lives uh, what it is that the gospel does. Um, 
But uh, going back to the issue of are Muslims uniform, uh, do they agree with each other and so on and so forth, uh, my reply is similar to his. One thing I would add is that uh, it, it appears that way. He mentions it's, it's a superficial unity. Uh, it doesn't go very deep. Uh, it's similar to Rome's unity, you know, uh, in a sense, where Rome's unity appears uh, to exist when that's only because they have a, a governmental hierarchy that, that makes it look like they're uh, all in agreement. But you go below that and you see all these differences between uh, Roman Catholics. Uh, well, similarly, m Muslims have all sorts of differences, but they're not apparent to us, if, you know, because we're not inside the system, if you will. Uh, if we're studying it, we start to see these things. Uh, but one of the things that makes it look more unified than, say, Christianity does to us is because we know our history better, and they know our history better than we know their history often, or than even they know their history. For whatever reason, uh, well, it's similar to the textual issue. We, we lay out the textual issues all on the table. You can look at the fact that we have multiple, you know, thousands of manuscripts of the New Testament uh, to compare with each other, and thus we have some textual variants. Scribes would accidentally, you know, misspell a word or something, and then uh, we would have to compare and collate man manuscripts and see where the mistake was made, and we're able to do that. Textual scholars believe that we're able to get at the original reading. We're able to determine who made the mistake and where. Uh, but Muslims don't do that, and it's similar with their doctrinal uh, diversions. Uh, so actually, uh, speaking on some of those, I, uh, here's something that uh, I'm uh, always interested in and bring up often with Muslims who tell us their doctrine is simple and that they agree on everything. The earliest, some of the earliest disputes, uh, close in time, uh, but actually this dispute precedes and actually results in the one that he talks about, about the Quran, the nature of the Quran. This dispute uh, concerned the nature of God's essence and its relationship to his attributes. The early, and in fact, what are his attributes? The earliest Muslims, called the traditionists, uh, the al-Hadith, the people of Hadith, right, the traditions of Muhammad, taught that Allah had hands, face, eyes, feet, shin, right? Ahmed ibn Hanbal most famously taught this. Along come the Mu'atizalites, you said, oh, uh, along come the Mu'atizalites, who were influenced by Greek philosophy, right, we were talking a little bit about Greek philosophy, they're influenced by Greek philosophy, and they realize that if you say that he has these qualities and characteristics, then he can't be a most simple being, he can't be the origin of the universe, right, because a simple being would exist outside of space and time and so forth, couldn't be composite, couldn't have qualities and characteristics that presuppose time, space, and so forth, right? So they said this has been possible. This isn't true to God's unity. So he doesn't have these attributes, hands and eyes and face. In fact, he has no attributes, they said. He's absolutely one, without attributes. So now, who is the right in this? Because uh, they both claim the Quran for support. The Quran says Allah is one and negates that he's anything other than one. Right? So they said, the Mu'atizalites said he couldn't have attributes. Right? The, but uh, the, the people of the Hadith said, no, he does have attributes, including hands, not just knowledge and power and love and that sort of thing. He has other attributes, like a shin, feet, and so forth. Uh, so who's right in this? Well, then come along, uh, comes along al-Ashari. Al-Ashari uh, took the methods of the Mu'atizalites, the, the Muslim philosophers, and he tried to use it to defend the position, the traditionist position. And thus you have something of a door open that eventually results in later Asharites, not Ashari himself, uh, but later Asharites saying that Allah has attributes but not anthropomorphic ones. So he has spiritual qualities like knowledge, uh, similar to the Christian view, right? God is omnipotent, omniscient, omnibenevolent, and so on, right? Infinite, eternal, unchangeable, and, and so on. Uh, so those, those are three different positions, and they're all held by different Muslims today. All of them, including the Mu'atizalite position. Some Muslims will tell you it's not around anymore. It certainly is.